Thank you, friend. I think there's a terrible positive gender imbalance in this panel. <laughs> and I'm indeed privileged to be the only male speaker. <laughs> I represent the Sarvode movement of Sri Lanka, which is a grassroots movement which has been around for nearly 60 years, which started as a very small uh, initiative by a group of students and teachers who went to a very um, uh, low uh, income community and started uh, working with the community to learn. And that small initiative, which was then developed as a very holistic uh, development model, became one of the largest civil society movements in our part of the world. So I have been associated with uh, the People's Health Movement and also, of course, my work has been through the Sarvode movement of Sri Lanka. The word Sarvode means awakening of all. We try to work with the individuals, then the family, then the community, both urban and rural, and then uh, the nationally as well as in global efforts to bring about uh, well-being uh, in our communities. So uh, my experience with the uh, commission uh, has been actually, even before the commission's work started, we all were part of a uh, global movement, trying out various things to uh, give justice to the communities which were deprived of good health, and also coming from a country which has actually achieved a very good status of health compared to the national income, we had also a lot to offer in this global struggle to uh, attain justice for most of the deprived communities. So if you look at the, uh, the commission, I think I would say it was a beginning. Uh, it marked the beginning of a paradigm shift. Of course, before that also we had initiatives like Dalmata, which inspired us and also gave a lot of impetus for us to work at the grassroots level. Now, Sri Lanka is a role model when it comes to achieving good uh, health with a low income. Uh, and I will share a little bit uh, of the Sri Lankan experience with uh, mobilizing communities. But also, it's my responsibility to speak for the global civil society because I was asked to speak from that perspective and share with you some of the challenges that I see as global civil society in uh, pursuing the goal of um, social justice and attaining uh, well-being. Um, I would like to just start with the Sri Lankan experience. Now, most of uh, uh, the, the, the studies indicate the, 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 the effectiveness and also the, uh, the good equity aspect of the Sri Lankan healthcare system and also attribute the success to the healthcare delivery system. But I would say that the healthcare delivery system was able to play its role in a much larger context. Now, I would say that context includes not just the health sector, but also we, ha we had a very, uh, uh, very effective free education system which went to the grassroots, universal uh, free edu uh, education system up to the tertiary level. And also, the much more important aspect, I think, is the democratic governance. In 1931, we uh, got uh, adult franchise, universal adult franchise, even before we gained independence from the British in 1948. This gave the power to the people to decide on the leaders whom, uh, who are going to represent them in the legislature. And this had a big impact on the people to demand what they wanted and also to some extent hold the politicians accountable. Then the larger social cultural milieu, actually this factor was neglected, this, uh, this factor was not recognized, and we have seen the uh, commission recognizing this factor so many years later. So it's in this larger context that we, have, we, we were trying to put into practice the concepts that have been um, uh, uh, promoted in the CSDH. This was a cartoon that uh, came out a couple of months back, because we are, our health system is under strain, now, after achieving so much, we have been successful in containing communicable diseases. We are shifting more towards uh, non-communicable diseases, but still there are uh, big challenges like dengue hemorrhagic fever and also um, uh, several other uh, localized uh, infectious diseases that are affecting our community. But as a whole, we uh, felt that the system has to change to address the new challenges. So the CSO journey in this, uh, uh, in this uh, with the commission, uh, as I stated earlier, started with the Almata. And we were able to, of course, be part of this uh, 
dialogue and evidence generation from a grassroots level. So there was, of course, the state health delivery system, which was uh, providing preventive and curative health care services to the entire population, but there were tremendous gaps. So social movement such as ours was trying to uh, address some of these gaps. May they be in nutrition or deprived communities like sex workers when it comes to sexually transmitted diseases or some of the mental health issues. So those were the areas that we were trying to fill in the gaps. I think this holds true even for the organizations where CSOs are really whole, uh, trying to bridge the gaps that are there when you look at the state system. So we were able to, using the CSDH process, uh, engage in a grassroots dialogue on these issues, what are the factors that determine your well-being? What are the factors that affect your health uh, or, or disease? So PHM Sri Lanka actually played a very important role in providing that input to the regional consultations as well as back to implementation. So we were able to, of course, with the very positive, uh, encouraging recommendations that were made by the, by the commission, we tried to implement some of these uh, recommendations in the Sri Lankan context. Even though we have achieved very good health indicators at the national level, our infant mortality rate is 8 per 1,000 live births, maternal mortality rate is 3 per 10,000 live births, all these indicators are excellent. But if you look at district-wise, there are 25 districts in Sri Lanka, there are tremendous disparities. And this disp these disparities are observed even during uh, the civil war we have had. So the war itself, which lasted for 26 years, had a tremendous impact. So we had uh, uh, challenges, uh, ch very uh, big challenges such as internal displacement, psychological trauma, dealing with injured uh, uh, civilians. So all these were uh, all these uh, uh, factors had to be taken into account in our own context. How we try to relate to the recommendations of the commission. So we try to lobby for health in all policies. I will not uh, go into details. Then, of course, one of the big ch biggest challenges was the thriving private health sector. Since 1977, our government adopted the neoliberal economic model, and uh, while the state health system was functioning, a private uh, health care system really got a uh, lot of investments from private investors, even though 90% of the human resources, in terms of specialist doctors, normal medical officers, and nurses, came from the state sector on a part-time basis. So this was a challenge. So the role of this voluntary sector in general, I'm not just drawing from our own experience in Sri Lanka. While providing services, we were filling gaps, and we were also doing advocacy, holding the processes and institutions accountable. It's not just the to hold the politicians accountable, but if the local hospital doesn't have enough drugs, even though we have a free healthcare system, how do you deal with that situation? And then also, of course, the sustained public education was needed, and sustained public mobilization in terms of organizing them in groups, trying to get them to understand what are the multiple determinants of a health problem, and trying to lobby them with them to link them with government services or where necessary make policy challenges uh, po policy changes so what have been some of our achievements we are very happy that today after 17 years of direct lobbying by uh, groups within and outside the government i must say that in order to uh, to see a change happen you need we all know champions from within the systems. So we have, we have been very lucky that we have had some champions within the state health service, as well as some enlightened politicians who are helping the grassroots movements that were lobbying to have a, a, a drug policy which was equitable, which gave quality drugs at an affordable price to the population. Although we have a free healthcare system, people have to spend a lot of money buying medicines prescribed from the government hospitals, from, by the government hospital doc doctors. So in last year, we had this act being passed in parliament, and now it is in effect. So though there are some shortcomings, we, it's a great achievement and a great victory for people's uh, movements that now we have price yeah. controls on, uh, on the essential drugs that are distributed in government hospitals. Then we had a parliamentary subcommittee. We were lo lobbying. The, par the People's Health Movement was lobbying to include health as a fundamental right in our constitution. 
We had a government change in 2015, which gave a lot of space for, for us to, as Sri Lankans, think anew. We were recovering from a terrible uh, war, which, which uh, claimed more than 100,000 lives and affected more than 2 million people of our country. So we needed a new beginning. So in the new constitution, there was a new discourse that started to develop a new constitution for the country. And I'm very happy that the, one of the six subcommittees that were appointed by the parliament to come up with a framework for the constitution proposed and recommended that right to health be included in the new constitution of Sri Lanka. It hasn't been still incorporated, but at least we have got to that stage and we are very happy. And that's a real victory for the movements that have been lobbying for this. Finally, some of the observations that we have had uh, on the CSDH process has been that we have been trying, I think the, the time that uh, CH, uh, CSDH report was released, we also had the MDGs and people were preoccupied with targets without really looking at the country's capacity to deliver those targets. And I think the, it got sidetracked. At the same time, there was no continuity. We, have, we all know that there are global development agendas uh, that uh, continue in different brand names, different uh, 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 models, but they are disconnected. So this has been a problem, and uh, we really need to look at, even now when we are at the beginning of uh, planning for the implementation of SDGs, that this weakness is overcome. Then the global economic architecture, of course we all know, in the morning we heard a lot of evidence towards that it hasn't changed and it's not very encouraging. So the challenges had been that there wasn't really a big buy-in and the interest could not be sustained. Some of the uh, key officials who are champions within the system, when they retire or leave the country, then we have a big void. There are no leaders to take on the baton and uh, run forward. And also the same uh, economic model being continued and people still believe in that and the politicians thrive on that and that's a challenge. So the disconnected global agendas, again, May it be the World Bank's uh, end poverty, shared prosperity model, or the SDGs, or other UN institutions' agendas, they need to be somewhat uh, coordinated, even at a country level, in order for uh, us to really achieve the uh, address inequities in our countries. Then also, this has also been referred to earlier, there had been systematic suppression of civil society organizations. We have had our own share of being the enemy of the people. They are being called traitors. So uh, this uh, situation has to be also faced by uh, many civil society organizations. And as for the future, I would like to say that actually having partnerships, partnership building with progressive forces, not just at a community level, but at a national level. It may be with professional groups, it may be with lawyers, doctors, uh, even private sector organizations or entrepreneurs, very ethical entrepreneurs, we need alliance building. And then work towards social justice. Continue to work on viable alternatives. CESOs have always been innovative, creative, trying to find models where cost-effective solution to health problems, that this effort must continue. Some of us get totally frustrated when there is government suppression and no encouragement. But in our part of the world, so many initiatives are there. These could be scaled up, and they have found effective solution to emerging health problems in the country. We have Right to Information Act, now enacted in more, many countries in the world. You can ask for information. You can ask for the local health budget from a local authority. You can ask the health ministry how many vacancies are there in the cadre of key cadre uh, in the health uh, uh, delivery system. And also open government partnership, which is an international agreement by governments to disclose information as well as engage with civil society to address some of the key problems. Our government has committed to this program and especially three targets have been identified. All are very, very relevant. One is on quality, quality of the health care delivery system, where we have achieved a lot in terms of access, but quality is a problem, which can then address inequity. Lastly, advocacy to make the global agendas work. So advocacy is not just holding meetings, but actually empowering each individual to understand the context in which that 
uh, individual lives and how it rela relates to the larger dynamics operating in a country that will affect his or her own health as well as the family's health and the community's health. So on the whole, civil society has a very critical role to play. It can't play this role alone. It has to have alliance with the academia, private sector, the governments, UN system, and all the progressive forces in the world that we can mobilize, then only we can win this battle. Thank you.